It's the last edition for the week. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Joker Rogers. Here's what's coming up on The World Today. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu publicly rejects U.S. push for Palestinian states once the Gaza conflict comes to an end. North Korea tests underwater nuclear weapon system. Plus, hundreds of lorries roll into Berlin to protest against rising logistics costs. The world today begins right now. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly rejected America's push for a Palestinian state once the conflict in Gaza comes to an end. Speaking at a news conference, a defiant Mr. Netanyahu vowed to press on with the offensive in Gaza until the destruction of Hamas and return of the remaining Israeli hostages, adding that it could take many more months. Israel has come under intense pressure to rein in it's offensive and engage in meaningful talks over a sustainable end to the war. Israel's allies, including the U.S. and many of its foes, are urging a revival of the dormant two-state solution in which a future Palestinian state would sit side by side with an Israeli one. Meanwhile, Israeli President Isaac Herzog has addressed the World Economic Forum in Davos, emphasizing that peace talks are unlikely while facing threats from Hamas and other groups. Mr. Herzog says the average Israelis lost trust in the peace process as they are worried about their safety in the future, even after the war ends. He also discussed the potential normalization of ties between Israel and Saudi Arabia as a crucial element in ending the conflict with Hamas. He described it as a potential game changer for the entire Middle East. But if you ask an average Israeli now about his mental or her mental state, nobody in his right mind is willing now to always think about what will be the, the solution of the peace agreements? Because everybody wants to know, can we be promised real safety in the future? The truth is that we are fighting a war for the entire universe, for the free world. I always say, if Israel was not there, Europe will be next. Because these barbaric jihadists want to get all of us out of the region and want to get all of Europe out of its place as well. And the United States is next too. I would also add that parallel to that, many Israelis are asking themselves in many uh, debates, and correctly so, how come such huge humanitarian aid goes in and Kfir Bibas and all of the other hostages are not even getting any help at all in any way, form or manner. Now we are praying that the medication that is being supplied with France and Qatar and the international agencies and others in Gaza will reach them, but that's only the beginning. Israelis are asking themselves, how come the, uh, the, the hostages are not getting anything? This is a big thing. This is an emotional stage we're in. And I think that when nations come forward and say two-state solution, they have to first deal with a, a preliminary question, which is a core question for human beings. Are we offered real safety? What will be the safety? What's the outcome of any process? And can we guarantee safety for ourselves and our people? But Mr. And I must tell you, in the last two years before the October 7th, there was a huge wave of terror that the world ignored. And Michal and me, we went going to bereaving families who have suffered horrible terror attacks and nobody gave a damn in the world. So we have to understand, that's why I'm saying, guys, terror is off. The world has to fight terror with no mercy in order to, hope, uh, to bring real hope for the future. Israelis lost trust in the peace processes. 
because they could see that terror is glorified by our neighbors. It's a key element in the discussion. The regional context is an axis for development and progress. It's an axis for a better horizon for all parties concerned. And clearly the Saudi option as part of it, as the whole normalization process, is a key to the ability to, to exit from the war into a new horizon. It's still delicate, it's fragile, it will take a long time, but I think that this is actually an opportunity to move forward in the, in the, in the region toward a better future. I view that as a, a very important development. I encourage all parties who are discussing the option of normalization with Saudi Arabia. I believe it is a game changer and it follows suit with the courage of nations such as Egypt, Jordan, and the Abraham Accords nations such as the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, the Kingdom of Morocco, and the Kingdom of Bahrain. It will mean a world change. Meanwhile, Israel says its troops have reached the southernmost parts of Khan Yunis as they expand their operations in the Gaza Strip's second biggest city. The military announced that dozens of Palestinian fighters from Hamas had been killed in close quarter combat. According to health officials, 172 people have been killed across Gaza. Meanwhile, medical staff at Nasser Hospital in Gaza's Khan Yunis are facing increasing struggles as they strive to continue their work amid escalating strikes on the city. Officials say the strikes at the hospital created a state of panic among the patients, wounded and displaced people who took refuge in the hospital, which prompted them to flee out. The attacks come as only a third of Gaza's hospitals are functioning after more than 100 days of war. And on the humanitarian operation, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has welcomed the move to deliver more medical supplies to civilians in the Gaza Strip. While the delivery of critical supplies to Gaza is encouraging, spokesperson for the Secretary General Stefan Dojeric says more aids need to flow in, need to flow in to reach the most affected people. Idle. The Secretary General welcomes the announcement of an operation to deliver additional and much needed medicines and medical supplies to the civilian population in the Gaza Strip and to deliver vital uh, med medicines to hostages currently held in Gaza. The entry of these critical supplies and humanitarian aid to Gaza is encouraging. However, much more aid needs to come in to the Gaza Strip. Uh, he commends the state of Qatar and France for all their efforts. The Secretary General also reiterates his appeal for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, and he also reiterates his call for the immediate and unconditional release of hostages and for their humane treatment. The Secretary General urges all relevant actors to ensure that sufficient humanitarian aid gets uh, it gets into and where it is needed in the Gaza Strip and calls for the reactivation of the private sector to bring in basic commodities into the Gaza Strip. The Secretary General expresses his continued concern about the high intentions in the region and calls for urgent de-escalation. The VOA's correspondent Ricky Rosen joins us now for more on this uh, Ricky, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he has told the United States that he opposes the establishment of a Palestinian state once the conflict in Gaza comes to an end. What's the Prime Minister's reason for the opposition? Uh, Netanyahu says he opposes a Palestinian state because uh, no, no matter which Palestinian group would lead it, they are all committed to Israel's destruction. He points out that there was a recent poll in uh, the West Bank among Palestinians that showed that 82% uh, support the attacks by Hamas on October 7th, and the Palestinian Authority, which is considered more moderate than Hamas, uh, refuses to condemn the attacks. And 
in this opinion, he seems to be supported by the vast majority of the Israeli public, uh, who um, a recent study in Israel shows that only 5% uh, supported a renewal of the peace uh, negotiations towards a Palestinian state. Um, Israelis from the whole spectrum, from re left to right, uh, are uh, saying that they feel too traumatized by their own experience of October 7th to think about negotiating with the Palestinians. Right, and many countries have favored the two-state solution as the best, uh, you know, to solve the Israel-Palestine crisis. But we see the Prime Minister is against this. How does he, you know, want to, the conflict uh, to be resolved? How does he propose that it's resolved? Well, for years, Netanyahu has always tried to manage a balancing act between the demands of the U.S. and most of the international community for a two-state solution and his own right-wing uh, opinions. And now, especially, he has a governing coalition with far-right extremists who have threatened to bolt the, uh, the government and bring down the government if there are any um, movements made, uh, realistic movements made towards a two-state solution. So he uh, maintains, as he has for many years, that Israel has to um, retain security control and somehow grant um, uh, Palestinians civilian control in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, but this is uh, obviously a non-starter uh, for the Palestinians or for most of the international community. Um, but in these days in Israel, uh, after having experienced October 7th, he now uh, has the support of the majority of Israeli. And the latest agreement we have seen uh, between Israel and Hamas is the permission for aid into Gaza. What's the latest at this time concerning the hostages in Hamas territory? Well, on Wednesday, uh, medication, much needed medication, which the families of the hostages were pushing to uh, try to get into Gaza for their family members, many of whom are elderly and in need of uh, chronic medication. Uh, Qatar brought in the medication, uh, one box uh, for each Israeli hostage uh, and 1,000 boxes for Palestinians in need of medication. Um, so far, uh, there's no news of whether the medication has reached the hostages, um, and uh, the army is supposed to be um, investigating to see that this was done. It did not go through the Red Cross, uh, because um, the Red Cross has uh, refused to play a role in this before, and, um, and so Qatar uh, said that they would be responsible for ensuring the delivery of medications. Right, it seems this is a breakthrough for the World Health Organization uh, and of course uh, the UN that has been pushing for aid to come into Gaza, especially uh, the medical supplies for the uh, thousands of people that need uh, you know, this medication uh, because hospitals are still targeted at this time. So uh, what, more, what more kind of push do you think needs to happen for you know, more aid to come in beyond just medical supplies for the people that need uh, clean water, that needs you know, uh, sanitary aid and other things that you know, normal people should have even in a war zone? It's very hard to say, uh, specifically because there's a war going on. Uh, I just spoke, I just did an interview with the head of the unit in the Israeli army that deals with Palestinian civilian affairs, and he insists that uh, at least 200 trucks filled with food and humanitarian supplies are being approved by the Israeli army to enter Gaza every day. And he insists that they are coordinating with the major aid organizations for the delivery, the safe delivery of this aid so that uh, Israelis don't uh, mistakenly um, conduct airstrikes in the in the areas in which the aid is being delivered. Um, on the other hand, 
the aid organizations say that there is a crisis, that there is impending uh, starvation, disease. So it's difficult in the middle of a war to determine what in fact is going on. The Israelis say one thing, the uh, Gazans say another. Right, Ricky, I must thank you for your time today. Thank you. Good night. Now to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, fire has broken out over a large area of an oil storage depot in southern Russia after officials say it was hit by a Ukrainian drone. Russian media say four oil tanks caught, uh, caught fire. The fire spread over an area of a thousand square meters. Russian authorities in the Bryansk region say no one was hurt. The Bryansk governor said the drone was intercepted near the town of Klinsky and its explosives then fell on the oil depot. The drone strike is the second on Russian oil facilities in two days. Russian reports suggested that the drone was shot down without causing damage, but there were indications that in Kyiv that the attack so far from the Ukrainian border marked a new phase in strategy. And NATO military chiefs of defense have concluded their two-day strategic meeting in Brussels, the summit that underscored the alliance's commitment to regional cooperation. Chair of the NATO Military Committee, Admiral Rob Bauer, provided insights into the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, highlighting that while Russia's recent attacks are devastating, the lack of military effectiveness as well. Uh, the, he noted that there has been substantial military successes in the Ukrainian side on the battlefield. On the other hand, NATO Supreme Allied Commander General Christopher Cavoli announced the largest NATO exercise in decades uh, involving approximately 90,000 forces from all 31 allies, including Sweden. The exercise aims to demonstrate NATO's unity, strength and determination to protect shared values and the rules-based international order. More societal resilience, more energy independence, resilient infrastructure. And across the board, but especially for a key topic such as integrated air and missile defense, we need a fundamentally new approach to public-private cooperation in the defense industry. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday we were briefed by the Ukrainian military representative to NATO, Major General Salkutsan, on behalf of Ukrainian Chief of Defense General Zalushny. Our assessment is there is intense fighting going on, and while Russia's most recent attacks are devastating, they are not militarily effective. At the same time, we see substantial military successes on the Ukrainian side. While the world may have been overly optimistic in 2023, it is important that in 2024 we don't become overly pessimistic. The only way to get a lasting negotiated solution is to strengthen the Ukrainian position on the battlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is seeing a record amount of violence and conflict. In the run-up to the NATO summit in Washington next year, NATO is actively looking for ways to strengthen and deepen its partnership in our southern neighborhood. That is why today the NATO Chiefs of Defense conducted a meeting with their counterparts from the Partner Interoperability Advocacy Group, being Australia, Austria, Ireland, New Zealand and Switzerland. And a dedicated session with NATO's Indo-Pacific partners, being Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea. Um, as you know, last summer, allied heads of state and government approved our regional plans, and they gave us the green light to continue with all aspects of modernizing our collective defense system. So for the first time in 30 years, we have the strategy, deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic area, and we have the plans to make the alliance fit for the purpose of collective territorial defense. So now we're in the process of making our plans executable. This means making sure we have the force commitments, 
the command and control arrangements and the enablement of our plan that our plans require. Steadfast Defender 24 will be the largest NATO exercise in decades with participation from approximately 90,000 forces from all 31 allies plus our good partner Sweden. The alliance will demonstrate its ability to reinforce the Euro-Atlantic area via transatlantic movement of forces from North America. This reinforcement will occur during a simulated emerging conflict scenario against a near peer adversary. Steadfast Defender 24 will be a clear demonstration of our unity, our strength, and our determination to protect each other, to protect, of course, our values and the rules-based international order. On a related but separate note, uh, a word about the Allied Reaction Force. The ARF is a critical component, component of our new force structure, of our new force model, and it supports our plans. The ARF is capable of carrying out a full spectrum of missions, and it serves as a rapid, deployable strategic reserve for SACIR. In the fall of last year, NATO Rapid Deployment Corps Italy was selected as the interim headquarters for this ARF. They are currently training, exercise, and rehearsing in preparation for their new role. They are on track to receive validation as the interim ARF headquarters following exercise Steadfast Defender as soon as May. Welcome back to the program. North Korea is not backing down with its nuclear uh, provocations as the country has carried out a test of its underwater nuclear weapon system in response to drills by the United States, South Korea and Japan this week. The underwater drone, which supposedly can carry a nuclear weapon, was tested off the east coast, which South Korea called a provocation. The South Korea's defense ministry also said the test threatens peace on the Korean Peninsula and the world, adding if North Korea directly provokes the country, it will respond with an overwhelming manner following the principle of immediate, strong and terminal uh, action. Pyongyang leader Kim Jong-un has also been increasingly aggressive in his policy direction and rhetoric, as he has repeatedly said, his regime is building up its military arsenal in preparation for war that could break out at any time on the peninsula. Well, 12 children aged between 7 and 12, as well as uh, two teachers, have drowned in India's Lake Kani in Vadurara city. Parents of school students who were on the boat that capsized have alleged that their children were not given life jackets. According to the police, two people were arrested in connection with the incident, and search operations are underway to find the remaining victims. Authorities say 18 students and two teachers have been rescued so far and are undergoing treatment in a nearby hospital. While the cause of the incident is not yet known, eyewitnesses say that the boat was packed beyond its capacity of 14 passengers. The tragic incident has made national headlines and many parents have accused the authorities of jeopardizing their children's lives by flouting safety norms. The World Economic Forum is wrapping up today and then the elite and government officials will depart their chalets and hotel suites, uh, their hotel suites in the Swiss Alps to head back home. Many, of course, via private jets. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres expressed deep concern over the swift impacts of climate change during his address. He emphasized the urgency of the situation and highlighted the paradox the world faces grappling with existential threats from both climate change and unchecked artificial intelligence development. I believe this crisis is the direct result of a paradox facing our world. In the face of the series even existential threats posed by runaway climate chaos and the development, the runaway development of artificial intelligence without guardrails, we seem powerless to act together. As climate breakdown begins, 
countries remain hell-bent on raising emissions. Our planet is still heading for a scorching 3-degree increase in global temperatures. Droughts, storms, fires and floods are pummeling countries and communities. Before travelling to the United Nations climate talks in COP28 in Dubai, I saw for myself the dramatic receding of Himalayan glaciers and the accelerated melting of the ice sheet in Antarctica. And here in Switzerland, glaciers are disappearing before our eyes, some are gone forever, and others have lost 10% of their volume in just the past two years. Such rapid changes should disturb us all. 2023 went down as the hottest year on record, but it could be one of the coolest years on the future. Let me be very clear again. The phase-out of fossil fuels is essential and inevitable. No amount of spin or scare tactics will change that. Let's hope it doesn't come too late. But we must now act to ensure a just and equitable transition to renewable energy. The technology has enormous potential for sustainable development, but uh, as the International Monetary Fund has just warned us, it is very likely it will worsen inequality in the world. And some powerful tech companies are already pursuing profits with a clear disregard for human rights, personal privacy and social impact. This is no secret. Geopolitical divides are preventing us from coming together around global solutions for global challenges. Little wonder that people everywhere are losing face in governments, institutions and financial and economic systems. I repeat my call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza and the process that leads to sustained peace for Israelis and Palestinians based on a two-state solution that is the only way to stem the suffering and prevent a spillover that could send the entire region up in flames. And I also call for a just peace in Ukraine, a peace in accordance with the United Nations Charter, a peace in accordance with international law. For more on this annual meeting of some of the world's most powerful in snowy Switzerland, we turn to DW's Cassandra Sundet in Berlin. Uh, great to have you. As we mentioned, this meeting attracts some of the richest people, billionaires and leaders of fossil fuel and wealth management companies. But there's been an interesting call from some of these wealthy people for higher taxes. Cassandra, can you tell us more about this? That's right. 250 billionaires and millionaires are telling the political elite in Davos to raise their taxes. They say those funds could help pay for better public services around the world. And it's obvious, obviously not just them personally, but other rich people in their income brackets. And some of the notable signatories from 17 countries include Disney heir Abigail Disney, actor Brian Cox, who played the fictional billionaire Logan Roy in Succession, and actor and screenwriter Simon Pegg. The group is called proud to pay and they want the world leaders gathered in Davos to hear them out. A new poll of the super rich in the G20 countries finds that about three quarters support higher taxes on wealth and super rich here, super wealthy just so you know, was defined as having more than one million British pounds in investable assets not including their homes. Speaking of wealthy people, the anti-poverty charity Oxfam says that the five richest men have doubled their fortunes since 2020. The new wealth figure a mind-boggling $869 billion. In that report released this week to coincide with the World Economic Forum, it also found that during the same period, 5 billion people around the world have been made poorer. But it's unclear if these messages are really breaking through. Switzerland's a very wealthy country, and those coming for this conference are really the richest of the rich in many cases. Last year, there were media reports that 116 billion billionaires attended the conference. There's also the leaders of some of the richest companies like oil company Saudi Aramco. 
And you mentioned oil companies just now and uh, energy security has been part of the conversations at Davos, hasn't it? Right. So this is all connected to the Houthi rebel attacks in the Red Sea. 15% of global traffic goes through this route, and it's an especially important artery for traffic going from Asia to Europe. Business chiefs say that these attacks could create bottlenecks for the shipping route for the shipping route and have knock on effects for months to come. And to start off, these issues could affect retail prices of, of many, many items. I was looking at one figure, for example, that says that a shipping container, one of those classic 40 foot containers, uh, that that price has uh, more than doubled since these attacks were stepped up. But looking beyond retail to the energy industry, there's also concern that any bottlenecks could affect the availability of oil tankers, according to the CEO of Aramco. Qatar's prime minister also said that LNG, or liquefied natural gas, that his country produces could also be affected by this conflict. So this is all to say that if energy becomes more expensive or harder to move around the world, that could cause inflation to rise again in many countries. Here in Europe, high energy prices were a big driver of inflation last winter. So if inflation were to rise again, that would be very disappointing, uh, an understatement there, for a lot of government officials who have really been hoping that slowly raising rates would help cool off inflation while avoiding a recession. But even as we're talking about fossil fuel availability and cost concerns about climate change, uh, are also raising eyebrows in Davos. Yes, there has been some really scathing criticism to set the stage a little bit here. Davos organizers have for years placed climate change at or near the top of its global threat list. But its annual meeting, it's quite ironic, is packed with the companies most responsible for climate change. This year, there are CEOs or top executives from at least 27 fossil fuel companies like Shell, Chevron, Aramco and BP. So. In a speech on Wednesday this week, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez delivered some really strong words. He pointed to the fossil fuel producers and their, quote, enablers still racing to expand production, even though their business is, quote, inconsistent with human survival. He compared the oil companies to the tobacco industry, saying they've ridden roughshod over their own science. This scathing criticism comes as the European Union is drafting some climate targets to help bridge its way to more ambitious 2050 targets. Right, Cassandra, thanks again. Staying with Berlin, hundreds of lorries and tractors from across Germany arrived in the capital centre ahead of a rally against recent toll hikes and rising costs for logistics companies. Around 350 lorries, around 40 tractors and more than 100 other vehicles gathered at the Brandenburg Gate. Protesters denounced recent toll hikes and taxes while also demanding better working conditions for professional drivers. A total of 1,500 participants are ex expected uh, for the demonstrations which took place on Thursday and was set to continue today. The convoy caused disruption in ca the capital's public transportation system and disturbed some traffic. Meanwhile, the farmers' protests are continuing in Farmers are continuing their protests in Toulouse, France, as over 400 tractors and 1,000 farmers have taken to the streets protesting against rising taxes as well and charges and other issues facing the agricultural sector in France. On Wednesday, trailers full of hay, manure, logs, branches and waste was dumped in front of Toulouse City Administration Building and numerous city roads. Tractors were spotted blocking roads and bringing the city to a standstill. Protesters also gathered in front of the Toulouse capital. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has called on the House of Lords to pass his flagship Rwanda bill as he warned peers not to frustrate the will of the people. He was 
giving a press conference the day after MPs approved the legislation. Mr. Sunak said it was now up to the laws to do the right thing. He was not given. He has not given a date when the asylum seekers will be taken back to Rwanda. The bill, which seeks to revive the government's plan to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda, was passed by the 320 to 276 votes in the House of Commons on Wednesday. Singapore's Transport Minister S. Iswaran has resigned after he was charged with 27 offences in a corruption investigation. In a resignation letter dated Tuesday, January 16, but published by the Prime Minister's office, Mr. Iswaran said he rejected the charges and will now focus on clearing his name. The nation's Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau said the now former minister was arrested in July. It was after it was alleged he obtained kickbacks worth 286.1 American, 286,181 American dollars from property tycoon ONG Bingseng uh, to advance ONG's business interests. Charge sheets show the favors uh, include tickets to football matches, musicals, a flight on ONG's private plane, and tickets to the Singapore Formula One Grand Prix. Eswaran was advisor to the Grand Prix Steering Committee, while ONG owns the rights to the race. At least 55 people across 10 states have died since last week after the coldest air of winter and multiple storms brought snow and ice to much of the United States. Ice storms brought down trees and power lines in the United States, a U.S. state of Oregon, a third storm in the impacting area. At least 10 people have died in Portland City from the storms and cold. However, more brutal weather storms are expected to hit the central and eastern United States by the weekend. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, joins us for more now. Maria, great to see you today. Uh, what's the latest on the deadly storms across the U.S.? Yes, you're correct. These storms have proved to be quite deadly. We are looking at storms all across the mid-Atlantic, um, the, the Midwest, um, and also right here in the Washington, D.C. area that have had major storms. And it's a bit early for uh, the United States to have these type of winter storms. Normally it's later for the month of January, early February, but um, they have definitely proven uh, to be one that unfortunately people have been losing their lives um, as a result of very poor road conditions is also affecting air travel. Uh, the airlines have also had to oftentimes ground planes or shut down for a period of time. And what areas are severely affected and have there been any warning alerts from officials as to where the brutal winter storm and cold would hit next? Well, um, they're tracking these storms all along, as you've mentioned, the west, the midwest, um, and right now on the eastern uh, seaboard is where you're seeing the, most of the snow. Uh, these are long spans of snow ranging from anywhere from 24 to 48 hours of constant snow, which is what you end up with the large accumulations. Uh, the other greater risk is once all the snow stops. Many people are dealing with icy conditions. So schools have been closed. Areas like Buffalo have been closed almost the entire week. And so this is really um, causing some major challenge uh, for many Americans. But uh, we're hopeful to see potentially by next week um, some reduction in the number of storms. Right. And, and, you know, looking at the patterns of, you know, how these storms come, uh, some are saying it's a bit early for uh, the snowstorms and this kind of weather uh, to, you know, to hit the areas that it had, not that the storms are not expected, but they're not expected, you know, at this time. Yes, uh, you're correct. It's a little early. Um, we typically see it toward the end of January, early February, as uh, we discussed a little bit, and, and sometimes all the way until um, early March. Um, but due to the conditions that are experiencing, this also creates an economic challenge uh, for many cities because the cost of snow removal can be quite vast. And so uh, it definitely is an all-around impact 
on Americans and obviously uh, the governments that are having to ensure the safety and protection of the people. And uh, not to mention the homes that have to be secured, uh, they have to be winterized. Uh, this is a very difficult time for individuals uh, who might not have great winterization on their homes uh, because they are dealing with such frigid temperatures that put people's lives at risk as well. Right, thanks again, Maria. Thanks for the update. Well, U.S. President Joe Biden says that he is committed to the middle class and continues to find ways to reduce corporate and bank fees on consumers. The recent presidential order will require banks to reduce the fee amounts applied to borrowers due to overdrafting. Our Washington correspondent Maria Bird is here again, and she had the opportunity to interview White House Deputy Director of National Economic Council, Joel Gamble, on the recent order uh, President Biden has enacted to reduce financial hardships on Americans. Joel Gamble, thank you so much for joining us. As we know, the White House is very much interested in learning and really making sure that the American people um, are protected um, as far as their consumer protection rights when it comes to their finances. We are in difficult times financially um, with many Americans still reeling um, from some of the economic challenges of the past few years. Tell us what this consumer protection uh, bill and, and what are some of the things the president hopes uh, will help the American people through this? And, and yes, lowering costs and giving family breathing room is the president's top priority right now. That's why his administration today is announcing a new rule to protect consumers from excessive overdraft fees. So we know when you, you know, have a, a check that you try to deposit and it takes a little long to hit and then, you know, there's a mismatch between how much you're spending and, you know, how much the bank says it has in your account or, you know, you make a mistake. The bank will often charge you an overdraft fee, but that overdraft fee is way higher than what it actually costs the bank to cover your costs, right? To cover the overdraft that you had. On average, Americans overdraft about $26, but the average overdraft fee is about $35. So this rule is meant to curb those excessive fees that banks are using to pad their bottom lines by doing two things, either asking banks to lower the cost of the overdraft fee to as low as $3, or treating the fees like the actual loans that they are and following the rules we've had on the books since the 60s to protect consumers when they are given a loan, which means being upfront about how much the loan will cost you and all the other terms related to it. So we know that, as you said, these are costs, especially now as many people are dealing with tight economic times that are uh, that many Americans are experiencing. What is kind of the hope and the savings that it could cr potentially create for the American people? Yeah, so we're estimating that this will save Americans who are currently overdrafting, which is about 23 million people, about $150 a year. You add all that up, that's $3.5 billion in savings per year. Which obviously then would essentially support the economy. So and tell us kind of where the president's sights are and, and the kind of his economics hope for the American people, especially the middle class, as we know that is a huge area of interest and has been for the administration. Yes, the president's top priority is to lower costs for American families. This rule is another step he has taken in order to do that. That's on top of taking on Big Pharma and helping to negotiate lower drug prices, lowering the cost of insulin for Medicare recipients to $35. He's really focused on making sure that we are lowering junk fees across the board. This is just about overdraft fees, but we're talking tickets, hotels, rental fees that you get when you rent a new place, for example, and then also focused on investing in things that we know Americans need, not only to take care of their children, but also be able to go to work. So that's things like child care and elder care, which has gotten really, really expensive. The president's been focused on trying to get more done to help support affordable child care in the United States. We just need Republicans in Congress to get their act together <laughs> so we can get more done. Thank you so much. And lastly, if we can just some of our audiences international and many of them travel to the U.S. You mentioned junk fees and airline tickets and hotel fees. Will this also help uh, those who are trying to continue to do business in the U.S. and those who are continuing to travel um, and participate in the tourism here in Washington in the U.S.? I think an economy that's a level playing field for American people means that there's more small business growth. It means that you see a lot of different kinds of restaurants who are able to make things work either because it's easier to start a business 
or you know they have more customers coming in the door. We've seen record small business app, new small business applications under the president. Just last week, we learned that there were about five million new applications last year, bringing the record up to sixteen million under the president, which is higher than the last the four years before he took office. And so we're seeing that as one of the outcomes from his agenda, which is really important if you're traveling to the United States. You come and you enter, you know, a city or a town or a neighborhood, and there's a lot going on, a lot of activity because people have an, a real shot in the country. And so it's all a part of the president's theory that he calls Bidenomics of growing the economy from the middle out and the bottom up. It benefits everyone, it benefits business in the United States, it benefits people who are coming to the United States to just travel, see what's going on. Well, thank you so much. Truly appreciate um, you taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. Have a great day. And when we return. Moscow Zoo's giant panda cub seen attempting to climb the steps in her enclosure. Details in a moment. Please stay with us. It's a fast beat, unpredictable and full of surprises. The unforgettable moments, unprecedented passion, the victories and defeats in the world of sports makes it engaging. Fasten your seatbelts as we take you through every update in the news and on our shows. We define the moments of true sports. Join us. Welcome back. We're in Africa now, where former Sierra Leonean President Ernest Bai Kuruma is reportedly on his way to Nigeria to spend three months allowed by the Sierra Leonean courts. We can confirm that the Nigerian Air Force One jet picked him up to convey him to the country. Two days ago, the former president was granted permission by the High Court in Freetown to leave the country on health grounds. Mr. Kuruma, who led Sierra Leone from 2007 to 2018, was charged early this month with four offenses for his alleged role in a failed military coup in November, for which he is facing charges of treason. Earlier, we spoke to editor of uh, Free Tong Post newspaper in Sierra Leone, Lawrence Williams, about the situation. From what we understand is that um, the former president was picked up this afternoon at the Free Town International Airport by the Nigerian Presidential Air Force One. He is expected to arrive in Nigeria in two hours' time. However, in a televised address last night, His Excellency Julius Marabio um, stated that um, the variation of the court order, which allows the former president to travel to Nigeria on medical grounds, is a humanitarian gesture. And that he also emphasized that um, this does not in any way detract from the seriousness of the offenses charged or the seriousness of the ongoing trials, but rather reinforces the position that uh, the whole thing is not a political witch hunt. And uh, the lawyers of the pres former president have not yet commented on uh, or reacted to the president's statement. Neither have they come out to explain exactly what um, are the circumstances surrounding um, the the president's move to Nigeria? Looking at um, taking to taking into account the ECOWAS's intervention, which calls for all charges against the former president to be dropped. However, um, going by the court ruling, is expected to be back in Freetown before the sixth of March when the trial resumes. In Burkina Faso, a spokesperson for the government has denounced what he called an obtained attempt at destabilizing the Celian nation. 
the Sahelian nation. He said a coup attempt had been foiled and alleged coup plotters arrested, citing findings of preliminary investigations. Rim Talba Jean Quadrogo said that the coup was scheduled to take place on January 14 as a network of military officers, some retired, some active, as well as civilians and activists conspired to destabilize the institutions of Burkina Faso. According to him, the network allegedly sought to target citizens' watch bodies to sway the people's support for the ruling MPSR, that's the Patriotic Movement for Safeguard and Restoration. An undisclosed number of people have been detained for questioning. Well, the second day of unrest in the Indian Ocean Island nation of Comoros has left one person dead and at least six others injured. The protest came after incumbent President Azali Asumani was declared the winner in an election held over the weekend that was denounced by the country's opposition parties as fraudulent. The announcement late on Tuesday uh, announced that Mr. Asumani had won a fourth term triggered violence protest that started Wednesday when a government minister's house was set on fire and a cart at the home of a car at the home of another minister was burnt. Pet owners gathered in St. Anthony's Church in Madrid for a blessing ceremony for their beloved companions marking the day of St. Anthony. Footage shows people queuing with dogs and cats of different breeds and sizes as well as sheep, goats, birds, and even turtles. A priest was seen sprinkling the animals with holy water. The annual ceremony is held on the day of St. Anthony, a patron saint of animals aimed at blessing pets as friends of their owners. And finally on the program, Moscow's giant panda club, uh, Kasyusha, was seen attempting to climb the steps in her enclosure at the zoo's facility. Footage shows that the panda's mum, Ding Ding, showing her baby how to do the climb uh, before the cub began to tentatively move between the wooden ladder of logs to the next room. The female panda cub, born in August last year, was named Kasyusha, or little Katharine, in reference to the popular Russian folk song, following a public vote on Moscow City's online portal, Katyusha's parents, Ding Ding and Rui, were brought to Moscow from Beijing in 2019. Giant pandas are native to China, with a few leased to other countries for conservation purposes. That's our program today. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers.